Today we read from Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 to the end. This is one of the two completely different creation stories in Genesis, probably the older one, or at least coming from a different tradition and locality. Those who edited the book of Genesis have juxtaposed the two, fully aware of the contrast between them, but no doubt valuing equally the insights offered by each. In this one, the Garden of Eden story, the style is of ancient myth, where each detail is imbued with a great deal of symbolic meaning. If we compare it to other contemporary creation stories from other cultures, it's remarkably sophisticated. Gone are the battles between the gods, the tearing limb from limb of enemies, out of whose body parts are made various aspects of the earth or, or its creatures. Here, God acts rationally, thoughtfully, purposefully, and with love. Humanity is depicted as being at the centre of creation. We may not be so keen on that approach today, but it was the perspective of the time. Our spiritual as well as physical nature are clearly indicated as the breath of God combines with the dust of the earth. Our role as stewards and carers of the earth is depicted clearly as well. It is as a garden which we have to till and care for. Every living creature was made for us and we even share in that creation by giving them their names or choosing their nature, their character that is. Can anyone question the importance of today's environmental movement in the light of this ancient wisdom? how little we have heeded this teaching over the ages. It's strange that this very passage has been used to justify our destruction of habitats and species when it's meant to show our responsibility towards all life. Extraordinary also that it's been used to justify male domination over females when it expresses equality between the two. Did you notice that? The animal life of the planet was found delightful but inadequate to provide a partner and equal to the man. But when his own body was used to make that other person, Eve or life, he greets her with relief. This at last, he says, is my equal. This one can be my partner, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. This one is the same as me. In the other creation story in chapter one, the same point is made in a different way, as God creates male and female simultaneously on day six. Far from being a primitive, perhaps quaint, but mainly relevant account of origins, this turns out to be remarkably prescient and wise. And of course, there is the test to bear in mind the one tree of which they should not eat. Any test would do. And an ancient myth of human origins would generally include some kind of test. It is preparing for the question, given that everything in the garden is so lovely, what could possibly go wrong? To which the answer, of course, is a very great deal could and did go wrong. People have always asked this question, why is there so much wrong in the world? And stories like this were written partly to provide an explanation, some kind of answer, and one that has a lot of value still today. Mainly it says that it was not God to blame, it was us, it's our fault, because we threw all this loveliness in. We acted in greed, selfishness, jealousy, pride, and foolishness, and we wrecked it all. We failed the test, and everything else followed. Or rather, we constantly and repeatedly do fail the test, generation after generation. Into this human condition came the incarnation which we have recently celebrated. The word made flesh of our flesh, living this life as it was intended, without making those mistakes, eating that fruit, without that selfish greed, that pride and blindness to the good. 
a whole, a wholesome human life. Here's one I prepared earlier, says God to the human race. Now, how about seeing if you can do it that way? Follow him and see how that turns out.